Hello all you guys and girls Greetings It's time once again for another spooky Saturday video 2021 edition By many 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 popular requests I'm bringing back some scary and it is a dark and stormy night here I don't know if you can hear the rain but hopefully that will help lull you off to sleep if the content I'm reading is not too spectacular for you I have, I believe, seven stories tonight and I think they're a little bit spookier than the last time but they're not so scary that you won't be relaxed, I think. I think you will still find this relaxing. As always, you can scroll along the playback at the bottom to skip to a specific story. And all of these stories are from Reddit, from very talented writers uh, on Reddit, and I will link to their stories so that you can give them the credit they deserve and you can also read along with me if you want. So hopefully that rain is not too distracting. Let's get started. The first one, I just took a DNA test. Turns out I'm 100% in over my head. Not a Lizzo song. I did one of those at-home DNA testing kits. You know, the ones that can supposedly tell you your ancestral makeup, help you connect with long-lost relatives, that sort of thing. And the specific test I used had this option to make your DNA available to law enforcement. That way, if there was a partial DNA match to a crime scene or a victim, my DNA may help law enforcement identify the perpetrator. Maybe I shouldn't have opted then. The thing is, I've read about these a lot in the news. If you're a true crime fan, you know that these kits can sometimes lead police to catch decades-old serial killers that have long eluded capture. My thinking was that if one of my family members is actually a monster, well, I would want them behind bars, regardless of who it is. So I opted in. But never really considered the possibility that there'd be a match. And then there was. I was contacted by my local police department and notified that my DNA had been a partial match to a Jane Doe, and that they'd like my help in identifying her. This was honestly not what I was expecting. I was a match for a dead woman? The police explained to me that our DNA profiles indicated we may have been related and that they wanted to know if I knew of any relatives who'd gone missing or hadn't been heard from in the past five years. Five years? Well, yes, because they've determined her time of death was about five years ago based on the state of her body when it was found. They have reason to believe it's a homicide, although they weren't able to tell me the cause of death. Apparently due to the state of her remains, it was impossible to tell. Well, I don't know of any family members who've gone missing, but I don't know my extended family all that well. I decided to get my mother involved, who does genealogy. She worked at the police, going through our family tree, but ultimately we couldn't find anyone. So, someone we didn't know we were related to, possibly? At this point, we decided to talk to the rest of my family, immediate and extended, to see if anyone else knew anything. Most of our family members thought it was pretty cool and wanted to see the mystery solved, though a few were angry at me for giving my DNA to law enforcement in the first place. The police showed us a sketch of what they think the woman would have looked like, and my mother and I agreed she had some resemblance to my Aunt Linda, particularly in the strong brow and the high cheekbones. The police decided to ask Aunt Linda and her two children, Ethan and Bex, to submit DNA samples. They agreed. It took about 
two weeks to hear back from the police after their samples had been submitted. They probably weren't at the top of the priority list for the crime lab, but when they did get the results back, they asked Bex, and Aunt Linda specifically, to come down to the station. Bex actually asked me to come with her. She and I were really close growing up, basically best friends. We've lost touch over the years, but I still consider her a close friend. I agreed to go with her, even though I wasn't sure why she wanted me there. When the police told us what they found, to say I was shocked is an understatement. The DNA from Jane Doe was an exact match to Bex. Of course, my initial thought was that there had to be some kind of mistake. I asked what the likelihood is that the DNA matched Bex without actually coming from her. One in 5.4 billion, they said. They told us that this was extremely perplexing and that they had no explanation for the match. I asked that Linda if Bex had an identical twin that nobody knew about, maybe, but she shook her head. The police told us that identical twins don't actually have perfect DNA anyway, so that wouldn't explain the match. I was perturbed. I'm sure you can imagine why. Bex and Aunt Linda, though, were not. They laughed, actually laughed, when the police pressed them with their evidence and shrugged it off. Isn't that just the weirdest thing? said Aunt Linda. They were both smiling and giggling the whole time, which clearly made the police uncomfortable. They told the police that they hoped Jane Doe could be identified one day, but that they were pretty sure they couldn't help any further, and then left the police station. I followed them in a daze, confused both by what the police had told us and by Bex and Aunt Linda's behavior. On the way home, I asked Bex if it truly didn't bother her. She said, come on, Veronica, there's obviously been some mistake. It's just not possible for my DNA to match exactly with a dead woman's. The cops screwed something up and they'll probably figure it out in a few days and call us and apologize. Don't worry so much about it. I tried to take her advice. My mom even agreed with her, saying it must be some kind of error and that it would get cleared up sooner or later. Three days after we spoke to police, Bex, Ethan, and Aunt Linda vanished. My mom had gone over to their place to borrow some family photo albums from Aunt Linda, discovered that the front door was unlocked and open. Nobody was inside. We tried to reach them on their cell phones, but were informed that their numbers had all been disconnected. Nothing was missing from the house. They didn't take any personal belongings. Their cars were in the garage. It was just like they vanished. And they didn't come back. We reported them missing, of course. And a few days after that, the police asked my mom and me to come down to the station. That's when they revealed that they'd run at Linda and Ethan's DNA through their databases and come up with two more exact matches to a Jane and John Doe, whose bodies are found within 50 miles of each other, and the original Jane Doe. All of them died about five years ago. Once is a mistake, or maybe a weird, freakish coincidence, but three times? The police were baffled. They asked us all for the information we could give them on my aunt's family. They specifically wanted to know what they were doing five years ago. All we could tell them is they'd gone on a family vacation that year, and they'd been gone a week longer than they'd planned. But otherwise, we had nothing useful. It's been a few months since then. The police have no answers for us, and we have no answers for them. I keep waiting for Bex to call, or show up, or any of them, really. But it's like they vanished off the face of the earth. The worst part is there's nothing I can do. I've done so much research to try to find something that can explain what's going on, but I can't come up with a theory that makes sense. Nothing 
grounded in reality, anyway. All I wanted to know is if I'm part Irish, and instead I ended up discovering that my family isn't at all what it seems. And that was our first short story. Alright, it's time for number two. This one is called Don't Google Yourself. <laughs> Don't Google Yourself. Why? Because you may not like what you find. One day, I was bored and decided to search for my own name on Google. I've quite a rare name, so I didn't expect to find many results. Imagine how surprised I was when I came across a website that had my full name in the domain. www.myname.com When I clicked the link, it brought me to a message board. I looked at the profile of the website owner and found out that the person was the same age as me, and had the same hobbies and interests. There weren't any posts on the message board, but I was intrigued, so I saved it in my favorites. It was about a month later when I went back to the website, and this time it had more content. There were some diary entries, mostly random things like, the weather was nice today, or I'm so bored at work, things of that nature. However, as time went on, I began to notice more and more coincidences. And the person lived in the same city as me. It struck me as rather strange that two people with the exact same rare name would be living in the same city at the same time. At one point I noticed all the contents of the diary were quite similar to my own life. One day I went to a basketball game. A baseball game. And when I checked the website that evening, I found that the owner of the site had gone to the same ball game. At first, I didn't think that much of it. After all, tens of thousands of people in the city supported the same baseball team. It began to feel like much more than simple coincidence. Whenever I checked the website, I would notice little biographical details that seemed too close for comfort. For example, the owner mentioned their pet dog, and the dog's name is the same name as the dog I had when I was a child. The website owner posted a picture of their car. It was the same model of car I'd been driving when I was in college. They talked about eating at a certain restaurant. It was the same restaurant I'd gone to all the time when I was working at my previous job. One day when I looked at the message board, people had written messages to the owner saying, happy birthday. That day was my birthday as well. I decided to write on the message board for the first time, just out of curiosity. I was going to wish the owner happy birthday and tell them we had the same name. However, when I tried to write something, I realized that there was nowhere to type. It wasn't a message board at all, just a static page. Odd, I thought to myself. In other words, whoever owned the website had gone to a lot of trouble to make it seem as if it were an interactive site, as if there were other people posting on it when, in actual fact, all the content must have been created by the owner. Why on earth would someone do that? I wondered. I decided to send an email to the owner. It read Hi there. Believe it or not, we both share the same name. Nice to meet you. It was just a friendly email. The next day, when I tried to look at the website, I discovered that it was gone. It seemed like it had been deleted. When I opened my mailbox, there was one reply. And when I looked at it, a chill ran down my spine. It just read, Found you. This next story is quite something because the owner of this story has 
included um, a lot more in this lore. So if you find this interesting, I definitely recommend uh, clicking the link to this story. There are other stories in this. It's a series. So um, I actually went through <laughs> earlier and I read a bunch of them. It's really interesting. Check it out for yourself. It's called The Previous Tenant of My New Flat Left a survival guide. I'm not sure I want to live here anymore. I moved in with my boyfriend yesterday. We've been together for five years now, and we're old and wise enough to settle down and finally leave our parents' houses. He just turned 24, and I'm 22. He's the love of my life. His name is Jamie, and I couldn't be happier to be living with him. When we decided to make the leap, we spent two months looking at flats and houses. We couldn't afford to buy it, so renting was our only option, but the prices were astronomical. For our budget, we would have been lucky to get a box room and a stove. Jamie works for a local 24-hour fast food restaurant, and I'm training to be a teacher. The early stages of training don't pay much, and I owe a lot in student loans, so finances are tough. We'd almost given up hope until we found our flat. It was nothing special, but to us, it was a palace. A spacious two-bedroom apartment with views of a city park, a balcony, and local conveniences. It was in a tower block in a not-so-nice area. But neither of us had been wealthy growing up. We weren't fussy. Just grateful to be together. The advert was sweetened by the deposit-free option and open-ended tenancy. The landlord was happy to sign a five-year contract if we wanted. And that sort of thing never happens in the city. We were told that along with no deposit, we would also have no inspections, but would be liable to pay for any damage when we ended the tenancy. I've never heard of anything quite like it. We knew that for our budget and location, we weren't going to get any better. We snapped place up fast, not even bothering to view it. Felt like our only chance. Moving day rolled around quickly, and yesterday we got the keys to our first home together. It was such a strange feeling. The day was chaos, getting our stuff in and up in the lift. We're flat number 42 on the seventh floor. The items we couldn't get in the lift had to be taken up all the stairs by the removal men. I think they were grateful we weren't any higher, but I still wish we'd been able to give them a better tip. In the evening, we settled down on our second-hand sofa, given to us by a cousin of a friend, and watched some TV. We smoked cigarettes on the balcony looking at the park and fell asleep on our mattress on the floor super early because we had no energy to put the bed together yet, and Jamie had work at a hideous time in the morning. We slept soundly last night. I felt safe and happy. I don't think that feeling is coming back anytime soon. And it's all due to the note I found this morning. I found it in the kitchen, having a coffee hours after Jamie had left for his early shift at work. It was in one of the cupboards that were fixed to the wall. There were a bunch of useful items from the previous tenant. Spare keys to the flat, a set of tiny keys that locked and unlocked the windows, unnecessary for those with kids this high up a spare smoke alarm batteries, and a folded up piece of paper. The note was handwritten with new occupier of flat 42, in beautiful cursive on the blank side. I opened it up and sat down to read. I can't really describe it to you, so I'm going to copy it out below. Dear new occupier, firstly, welcome to your new home. I lived here before you for 35 years with my husband. Unfortunately, he had an incident at home recently that I'd rather not discuss that claimed his life. My sister has now decided I can't keep up with the demands of the property and has insisted that I move in with her and her husband. I was reluctant at first, but the stairs do kill me at my age, and without Bernie, it's filled with sadness. Anyway, when you've lived somewhere for as long as I have, it feels like a person that you know. You understand its personality and what makes it tick. I thought it was probably pertinent that I impart some of that knowledge on you. 
it's a wonderful home, honestly. I've lived through best and worst years and leaving it behind is very emotional, but if you are to survive and get the best out of it, then there are some steps you need to follow. Number one, the landlord will never bother you. He doesn't visit, call, or communicate in any way. Then make sure to pay your rent in a timely fashion always. I've only dealt with him once in 35 years, and let's just say I never missed another rent day. Any repairs required, you speak to the agent you rented the place with. Number two, do not use the communal lift between 1.11 and 3.33 a.m. Just don't do it. This step is vital if you are to have a happy life here. It really is life or death. Don't do it. This has cost me and many others in the building greatly. And I would rather not elaborate on why you shouldn't do this. Just please don't do it. I cannot stress this enough. Number three. When you hear the strange animal sounds coming from flat 48. Don't question it. Mr. Prentice lives there and he's a lovely chap. Don't be afraid to say hello to him in the corridor or on the stairs. He's old school, so he never risks the lift. Um, but whatever you do, don't check on him when you hear the noises. You'll know when you hear them. Number four. If you ever come across a window cleaner on the balcony, ignore him. He may seem like the nicest fellow you've ever had trying to sell you something at the door, but it really is best that you don't engage. He will go away if you ignore him. But he tries pretty hard the first few times, so you'll need some resilience. Whatever you do, do not offer him anything. No money, no hot drink. Number five, don't leave food scraps out. Bin or refrigerate them immediately. If you have small animals, it's imperative that you watch them eat and take away any leftover food immediately after they are done. This and rule two go hand in hand. The things forage all day and seem to really love animal feed. You don't want them in your flat. I promise. You can leave what you want out between 1.11 and 3.33 a.m., so you may want to feed your pets then. Number six. Don't communicate with any neighbors who claim to come from flats 65 through 72. These flats suffered a fire in the late 80s that devastated the whole floor. All of the residents died in their homes. The building was mostly council-owned at the time, and they never bothered to renovate the flats. They've been empty ever since, but every now and again, someone will knock at your door, claiming to live in one of these flats, and ask to borrow some sugar. They will seem entirely average, but you must shut and lock the door immediately. I installed two extra security bolts to avoid them. Number seven. Simple one for you here. Keep a weapon in each room. Sometimes you follow all these steps, and something still slips through the, net, through the net. Better to be safe than sorry. Number eight. The building has a committee that will try and get you to join. It's one of those neighborhood groups about improving living conditions for all residents. It's a nice group, and the lady who runs it, Terry from Flat 26, is a fantastic neighbor. But by all means, by all means get involved. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend babysitting Terry's two children. She'll ask you because the poor woman needs a break. But if you accept, don't say I didn't warn you. Number nine. Stray, hairless cats sometimes roam in the hallway. I know they're supposedly a special, expensive breed, but they don't belong to anyone. They're mostly harmless, but don't pick them up. Not unless you see one of those neighbors that claims to live in 65 through 72, then grab the cat and lock it inside with you. It'll burn your skin a little, but the cats are friendly and I wouldn't want to see them hurt. Number 10. There's no way to fix the damp patch on the ceiling in the bedroom. Sometimes it will turn a deep crimson and look quite concerning, but please try not to be alarmed. It doesn't drip. 
doesn't get any bigger and it's been there longer than I have, the landlord won't budge on it, according to the agents. I flagged it many times, I even called the police the first time it changed color, but it was a waste of time and it will be for you too. It's best to ignore it. Number 11. You can trust the postman. His name is Ian Flanders and he's been the postman since before I moved in. He has his own key to the main door and delivers post to the door every morning at 8.54. I can include, I can't include everything here or it would become a novel, but if you have any questions, Ian will help you. And number 12. Finally, the last few weeks are the worst. You'll feel like you've made a mistake. I'm sure reading this you already do, but if you can get through the first few weeks, it really is a lovely block to live in. Every property has its quirks, and this one is a little extra special. But you can be truly happy here if you just take my advice. I wish you all the best, I really do. Yours truly, Mrs. Prudence Hemmings. I don't really know what to think after reading the note. Hopefully it was some sort of joke, but the agent had said the previous tenant was an elderly lady, and I can't see anyone named Prudence Hemmings attempting to play practical jokes on someone they have never met. There were also parts of the note I couldn't disprove because there was a large damp patch above the bed that me and Jamie had already discussed reporting. No crimson, but it definitely existed. I had also commented on a beautiful sphinx cat roaming the halls as we were moving in. I started to get seriously freaked out. Our, our dream, our little home, had just become a source of fear and confusion. I checked the time and it was 9.14, Damn, out of time to catch postman Ian. When I opened the door to check, sure enough, two letters addressed to a Mrs. Hemming sat on the doorstep. At about 11.15, my worst fears were truly confirmed when a friendly, middle-aged looking man carrying window cleaning equipment knocked on my balcony door. I ignored him. I didn't want to take the risk until I'd spoken to Jamie and showed him the note. I texted him already to rush home. I felt bad as the man wrapped his knuckles again against the door for over 10 minutes, but honestly, the longer it went on, the more I was terrified. My windows were sparkling, and due to our lack of curtains, I couldn't even hide from his gaze. I felt so exposed. He stayed for a total of 30 minutes, exactly, and never once did he stop looking at me, or knocking. He shouted the occasional ultra-friendly line, or humble request for a beverage in the heat through the door, but I did my best to avoid eye contact. When he finally left, I looked outside every window in the flat, but I couldn't see him or any of the other balconies, or see any equipment suggesting he was around. He'd vanished completely. Jamie still hadn't texted me back. He must be having a rough shift. It was Friday morning, and they were always busy. It wasn't often that he didn't reply. He was due home in about an hour, anyway. I read the note probably hundreds of times over. I tortured myself reading it for the next hour, desperately waiting for Jamie to come through the door to tell me I was crazy and I should relax. I hoped for that much. But Jamie never came. His shift should have finished around midday, but by 2 p.m. he still wasn't home. I panicked. I cried. I left over 100 voice messages on his phone but got nowhere. I finally decided it had been long enough and that calling his work wouldn't embarrass him and his boss told me that he never turned up for his shift. I thought about it. What could have happened? And then it hit me. Jamie's shift started at 4 a.m. today. He would have left the flat at 3.15 and taken the lift down the stairs. I don't know what to do. I've tried to convince myself it was all a joke. Maybe Jamie wrote the note and got his boss in on it. A voice in my head kept telling me that he couldn't write like that if he tried, but I had to attempt to fool myself. It's getting late, and he still isn't home. What if it's all true? Now, if you found that intriguing, again, I highly recommend you go and you continue the story because it has a full... There's like a full series to it. 
This next story is called My wife is four years pregnant Upstairs Upstairs I find Angie waving her arms in midair Conducting the paintbrushes and rollers like a symphony orchestra She's redecorating the nursery Again I nod graciously while she explains how our baby would respond better to a more wintergreen palette. There are only a few patches of soft ivory left on the walls. Last month it was pale turquoise. Before that, powder blue. Four years ago we settled on light beige, and now our denim overalls are rainbow stained. Before I can stop myself, I think, soon we're gonna get a bigger color swatch, then Angie's expression darkens. The light bulb in the ceiling blinks. I quickly imagine plants and trees. A green is perfect. Our child will feel like they're surrounded by nature. She brightens up and then beckons me toward her. I slide across the room without moving my feet. Standing up on her tiptoes, she gives me a kiss. And that's how my day was. I'm midway through telling her about a new sushi place when she interrupts with, I've got something to show you. Facebook group started by a lady in New Zealand who's been pregnant for five and a half years. The members all suffer from a condition where no detectable HCG can be found in their system due to a hormonal imbalance, resulting in an unusually long pregnancy. Both blood and urine tests will be negative, of course, along with any ultrasounds. Angie says she's going to show it to an obst obstetrician. I force a smile and say, that's great, honey. But I can't help cringing inside. Hopefully the next doctor is more understanding than the last one. He chuckled when Angie explained the nature of her disorder. Poor guy had to have a closed casket funeral. The brushes and rollers all come to a stop. As Angie shoots me a look, my thoughts immediately switch from condescending doctors to the salmon sushi I had for lunch to how tasty it was mixed with soy sauce. I really should take Angie there and have her order the platter since she's eating for two. Around the room, utensils spring back to life. At the far side of the house, I stare at the ceiling of my study. Angie can't hear my thoughts from this far away. My wife is completely delusional, which combined with her talents makes her dangerous. From out the hall, Angie shouts, we need to go shopping for baby clothes. Before I can catch myself, I think, again? Plaster flakes off the ceiling as the walls start to rumble. I think of pointless things like, uh, two plus two is four. <laughs> the door splinters in half. I picture Angie in a rocking chair, a beautiful newborn nested between her arms. The baby has her nose, her smile, her beautiful emerald eyes. My wife is four years pregnant. Only four years. She'll surely start to show any day now. I can't wait to be a father. The house finally settles. Then I say, sure thing, honey. I thought that one was really different and fun. I don't know if you've seen one division, but it reminds me. Here's another sort of quickie one called We can't stay in the basement for more than 30 minutes Make sure to start the timer the instant you cross the threshold You'll feel a sensation as you open the door and start down the stairs There's a tingle It's like walking through an electric field static tugging at you gently It's not entirely unpleasant The feeling fades quickly as you descend Temperatures vary, step by step. You'll encounter pockets of arctic air, heat as if from a foundry, dead breezes that hang like apples from invisible branches. And once you reach the basement floor, take a moment to collect your bearings, memorize your surroundings. That will help you notice when they begin to change. The first ten minutes will be almost entirely safe. Alterations are typically minor, the wallpaper may change suddenly. 
shifting from one pattern to another, any paintings on display are also likely to rearrange their contents or reposition their placement. If you feel like the eyes of a portrait are following you, that's because they are. Don't panic. You're still safe. Minutes 6 through 15 usually include unexplainable auditory events. You may hear laughter from the corner of the room, a child crying from the pantry, or whispers floating up from under the foosball table. Again, during this time period, you are still not likely in any significant danger. However, if something calls your name or asks you a question directly, it goes without saying you shouldn't respond. The final 15 minutes are less consistent than the previous 15. You may see unusual shadows that begin to form familiar shapes. If you look too long, note, reflective surfaces will show you clever lies. They can injure you, but they might distract you. You want a timer on your watch to beep every minute during the last ten minutes. It's very easy to lose track of time down there. Most likely, the room will shift. The beige couch pushed up against the southern wall might become two red chairs the second time you look at it or a small coffee table, or a black door. Rugs will become tile, which will become stone, which will become grass. The final five minutes in the basement are optional. There is some risk. Shadows might bump into your legs, swimming on unseen currents. One or two may even take a bite, though it's rare for them to engage beyond that. Doors and windows and tunnels will appear. They'll call to you, each in their own way. Some will even pull with a type of soft gravity. All harmless as long as you stay put. Make sure you never lose sight of the stairs. The real stairs, not the new ones that press against the walls like boils and crawl about the room. It's quite an experience, the basement. As long as you've crossed the threshold, back before the timer reaches 30 minutes. For some reason we don't understand, it takes half an hour for the room to become fully aware of your presence. And when it wakes up, it's hungry. <laughs> I thought that one was interesting. A lot of creepy houses and there are stories today. Alright, this next story is called My Friend Says That They're Psychic. I'm not sure why I hang out with Kyle. He's kind of a crappy person. His entire job is scamming grieving families out of money. It's kind of sad how desperate people get. They just want to talk to someone they've lost. They latch onto Kyle's fake words, genuinely believing what they hear. Did someone in your family have the letter E in their name? Oh, I'm getting a tight feeling in my chest, like I can't breathe. Oh, they're telling me something about a vacation. You see, real easy to attach someone you know to that. It makes me kind of sick knowing what he's really doing. Kyle's quite the character, though. That's probably why I hang out with him. He's got this huge crystal ball that shines and shimmers and an electric blue cape that he always wears, even when he's not doing the readings. He dyes his hair the same shade of bright blue. Even when he's not working, he still keeps the act going. He offers to give readings to random people on the street or in the supermarket. It weirds a lot of people out. Sometimes I think that it's not really an act. Sometimes I think he sincerely believes he's psychic. You need help, dude. He ignores me, like he always does. Kyle loves living in his echo chamber. He just turns to me with a smirk and says, You ready to summon the dead? He checks his hair once more in the rearview mirror before walking up the house. The owners of the house greet him warmly and they all sit down to do the stupid reading. I've been to so many of those and they all follow the same formula. It's starting to bore me. 
after about 15 minutes of listening to Kyle drone on and on, I get up from my seat and look at the fancy artwork covering the walls instead. Like usual, nobody notices. Nobody acknowledges the other person who walked in behind Kyle. Nobody offers me tea or cookies or asks me my name or shakes my hand. When I get bored and start wandering around the house, nobody tells me to stop being so nosy. When I say something to Kyle, I know he won't listen. Even though he says that he's psychic, I know he's lying. I got, um, you know, six cents vibes from that one. It's been a really long time since I've seen that film though, but if you've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I was gonna stop at six stories, but I came across this one story that is so perfect, guys. It's called Dingles. I had to read it, and um, I just think it's, it's nothing could be more fitting for an ASM artist reading a scary story than an ASM artist reading a scary story about an ASM artist. Uh, thank you, you slash decorative gentleman, for writing a story about us. <laughs> okay, you guys ready? Here's our last story. Tingles. I'm an ASM artist, or an aspiring one at least. I might be crazy for trying it. The YouTube community being pretty flush with soft whispers and nail tappers and optometrists optometrist role plays, but I think I've got something different. I read death. I guess I should explain that. <laughs> All the other artists out there generally stick to relatively mundane or even pleasant scripts or just finger hairbrush and say nothing. I whisper about death in graphic detail. It's morbid, certainly. But there is something to the incongruity of a pleasant tingle and the word eviscerate, isn't there? Really, it started to fight the boredom of the read. ASMR probably doesn't seem like acting, the dull one-sided dialogue and the gimmicky triggers, but it is. You have to appear interested and engaged when your only real audience is a Nikon DSL-4 and a microphone with silicone ears. For me, Gore was that necessary component that made it bearable. You're probably frightened right now. Oh. This knife is a Gerber Deercraft in flat sage. The color looks really nice with crimson. Link in the description below. Yeah, I plug. <laughs> but an artist has to make a living, and my Patreon hasn't quite taken off yet. Let's just start here at your navel and work our way up to the sternum. There we go. Right along the Linnea Alba. Does it hurt? Yeah, I bet it does. Your eyes are widening and your face is gone as white as a sheet. That's shock. performance takes a lot of anatomical research to really sell it. I have to know my way around pain terminology, uh, nociceptor pathways, or referred pain, visceral pain. There was a learning curve at first. Oh no, sleepy. That's okay. This is an EpiPen. I tap my nails on the plastic cylinder. I'm still a sucker.
so far. I have a very small but committed audience. They must like the concept or the delivery. Maybe they just like my foley work. A squish of innards or an off-camera scream muffled by a lot of caution. Two feet of duct tape. It seems so real. For those who subscribe to my Patreon, well, they know my secrets. Jeremy was a rapist, and for a top tier subscription, two of his victims get a behind the scenes look at my production. It may be messy, but sometimes the sound alone isn't what they need to get the tingles. It's the personal attention and the knowledge that when the video is over, only thing you'll hear behind them on their walk home is silence. <laughs> I feel like I should include a disclaimer that I have never killed anyone <laughs> as part of my video making process. Not even books. <laughs> yes, I thought that that was an amazing sociopath um, or psychopath but it was funny to pretend to be one for a little bit hopefully those stories didn't freak you out too much and you can get going to sleep thank you for watching I will have a couple more spooky Saturday videos this month sorry that I kind of forgot that October was a thing for the first couple See <laughs> you.